At the turn of the millennium, Square hosted an exclusive event in Tokyo to talk about their plans for the future. They invited 10,000 lucky members of the public, as well as major news publications from around the world, and together they all got to bear witness to something pretty special, as Square dazzled their audience with a slew of unexpected announcements. As noted by IGN at the time, it was an unprecedented move for a video game publisher, and such was the magnitude of the event that Square even pushed it back due to worries that the announcements would be so huge that they might even affect the performance of existing titles that were on sale. They also wanted to make sure that everything they presented would be of the highest quality, and looking back, it's fascinating to see how much things have changed, but also how much things have stayed the same within the company even after the merger with Enix. At the time, Square were known for producing high quality RPGs, but they had also gained a reputation for experimenting, and pushing themselves to be the best company that they could be. And this was front and centre at the Square Millennium event, where they announced a host of games for the upcoming PlayStation 2, all from very non-RPG genres, like Driving Emotion Type S, All-Star Pro Wrestling, Gekku Gun Pro Baseball, and The Bouncer. They also showcased other titles like Vacant Story, which was going to be released on the PlayStation, but all of this just served as a taster for the main event. The announcement of three brand new Final Fantasy games that would all be releasing within the three years that followed, and each game had been designed to fulfill a specific objective. Final Fantasy IX would act as a swan song for the franchise on the original PlayStation, serving as a tribute to everything that had come before. Final Fantasy X would act as a curtain raiser for the franchise on Sony's new PlayStation 2 console, and the last game? Well, that was designed to be something of an experiment, much like Final Fantasy Tactics had also been a few years prior. This third game would see Square and the Final Fantasy franchise tread new ground by taking fans to places they never thought they'd go and giving them experiences they never thought they would have. This is the history of Final Fantasy XI. When Final Fantasy XI was announced at the Square Millennium event, it was met with a mixed response. Up until that point, Square had become synonymous with producing offline RPGs that contained rich narratives and compelling gameplay mechanics, and it was difficult to see how this would translate into the realm of the MMO. Yet that was the challenge. They had to show that Final Fantasy could work as an MMO, but the initial step was to convince themselves that it was possible. Development on Final Fantasy XI began in November of 1999, only a few months prior to it being revealed to the public, something which perhaps would not have been possible had the Square Millennium event not been delayed. But the notion of creating an online Final Fantasy game was conceived some time before that. After moving to Hawaii in 1997, Hironobu Sakaguchi started to gain exposure to Western games, and he was drawn to one genre in particular, the MMORPG. Thanks to games like EverQuest, Ultima Online and Lineage, this genre had gained considerable popularity, and Sakaguchi was desperate to learn more. To achieve this goal, he sought out a Japanese MMORPG, but after realising that there were none of any note, Sakaguchi saw an opportunity. He believed that Square could be the company to fill that particular void, but he was also adamant that it shouldn't just be done for the sake of it. He wanted this new online game to be used as a tool for fostering relations amongst different cultures and communities. Instead of imposing segregation, like other MMOs, Sakaguchi wanted the game to be playable across multiple platforms with geographic server restrictions removed. He envisioned a game that would allow someone in Japan playing on one system to interact and explore the exact same world instance as someone playing in North America on another system. Upon learning of this grand idea, many senior figures in Japan, including Hiramichi Tanaka and Koichi Ishii, were apprehensive, at least during initial conversations. They had become comfortable producing offline experiences, and had no experience working with persistent online worlds. As Tanaka noted in an interview with French publication Jeux Video, seeing MMORPGs for the first time was something of a culture shock. He compared it to how they felt when they first saw Wizardry on the Apple II a decade prior, but noted that this new shock would only serve to inspire and motivate them, much as Wizardry had done before, especially after they played EverQuest at Sakaguchi's recommendation and saw the appeal almost instantly. And this was because in 1999, 
Square had largely become accustomed to success. This was true when looking at what would be perceived as their bread and butter, but also when they ventured into new areas where they had no real experience, and it gave them a huge amount of confidence to tackle new challenges head on, especially if they were fueled by Sakaguchi's passion. Final Fantasy, which was now a critical and commercial success on a global scale, was the epitome of this. The franchise had been guided down a new and daring path by Yoshinori Kitase, Hiroyuki Ito, and Sakaguchi, and as they moved onto the PlayStation, FMVs were incorporated seamlessly. From the outside, Square were perceived as being cutting edge at the forefront of technology, but the truth was, they had no prior experience working in CG movies whatsoever, and Sakaguchi just dared to try. This mantra became part of their culture, it was contagious, and in the years that followed, Square rolled out success after success. Titles like Chrono Trigger, Parasite Eve, Final Fantasy Tactics, Einhander, and Tobal 2 all proved to be smash hits, and what's impressive is that they were all in completely different genres. There was also a lot of optimism about Chrono Cross, but with that wrapping up, Hiromichi Tanaka was selected as the logical choice to manage this new project. Prior to Chrono Cross, Tanaka had acted as the producer on Xenogears, Secret of Mana and Threads of Fate, and having joined the company at the exact same time as Sakaguchi, after they both dropped out of university together, he had Square's ideologies ingrained in his DNA. Koichi Ishii was initially reluctant to be involved with the project due to the freedom he was enjoying working on the Mana franchise, but after Sakaguchi showed him EverQuest, it got his creative juices flowing and he was appointed as the game's director. Due to their collective ability to adapt and tackle new challenges head on, the team saw no reason why they couldn't rise to the challenge of creating the online experience that Sakaguchi had envisioned, and such was their confidence that it was decided that they should put the reputation of the fabled Final Fantasy brand on the line by choosing it as the subject matter for this new venture, even going so far as to make it a numbered title, as opposed to calling it Final Fantasy Online, after they saw the strength of the narrative that was being developed. It all turned out to be something of a dream for both creators, even if Ishii was initially resistant to go back to working on Final Fantasy again. They had both worked on Final Fantasy 1, 2 and 3, and even though they were well received at the time, their imaginations were both restricted by the technological limitations of the time. Because of this, they saw Final Fantasy XI as a real opportunity to create the Final Fantasy game they had always dreamt of making. In many ways, it negated their lack of experience working with MMOs, as instead of just attempting to imitate what other Western companies had done, the duo instead chose to learn from them and then impose what they perceived to be the core values of Final Fantasy onto the genre. By taking this approach, they hoped to craft an MMORPG that would be different from anything that had ever been seen before, but they knew there needed to be a fundamental set of principles that would guide them. Based on Sakaguchi's vision, one of these would be that the game needed to have the ability to connect cultures, and to complement this, Ishii decided that they should also focus on teamwork and how knowledge and possessions would flow. To help achieve the former, Tanaka spoke with haste to various hardware manufacturers to see how they could support the initiative, as when development started, they knew it would require a hard drive and no console on the market had one. It was then that they learned of Sony's plans to develop a new version of the PlayStation 2 that would incorporate an expansion bay capable of housing both a hard disk drive and a network adapter. They also spoke with Microsoft about their upcoming Xbox, but after realising that the console couldn't handle Final Fantasy XI's requirements, they had to cease production. The decision was also made that Final Fantasy XI should launch at the same time in both Japan and North America. This had never been done before with a Square product, but they believed it would highlight the inclusive nature of the experience that they were crafting. Up until that point, games developed in Japan were notorious for having a long lag between their Japanese and North American releases, with European releases taking even longer due to there being so many different languages. This lag was often due to resource management, as translation work would happen late on in development, once all other essential parts were complete. In some cases, it wouldn't even take place until after the Japanese version had shipped. To circumvent this delay, it was decided that translation activities would instead take place during initial development, and as explained by Richard Honeywood, who was the localization director on Final Fantasy XI, this innovative approach saw translations happen 
immediately. Because of this change, the role of the translator became much more important as they were able to provide real-time feedback and immediate changes to the source material could then be made, if necessary, to accommodate for language nuances. Characters, spells, skills and place names were also impacted, as Honeywood worked from day one with Kenichi Awao to make sure they sounded natural to both Japanese and English speakers. But perhaps the biggest innovation in this regard was the auto-translation feature. This was embedded into the game to help Japanese and English speakers communicate without needing knowledge of the other language. In initial planning stages, the team attempted to come up with a complicated translation service akin to what Google Translate offers consumers today, but they quickly realized that such an implementation would be troublesome as it often provided confusing answers. Honeyman then thought about foreign travelers and how they can make do with a simple phrasebook. Using this as their impetus, the team decided to create a new system that would contain small but useful words that could then be combined to make simple sentences used to denote intent. It meant that Final Fantasy XI had plenty of core systems that could help to act as a bridge between cultures, but it was also important to establish how the game would look and feel, and central to everything was Vanadiel, the magical world in which Final Fantasy XI was based. Before anything else, Ishii drew a world map and started coming up with the names for the various towns and lands scattered throughout. He then worked to create a skeleton framework for everything else, as he looked to establish what was needed to create a successful online game. This related to the world building, but also the scenario, battle mechanics, art style, translations, factions, and naming conventions, and each of these elements related to the notion of teamwork and flow. Having worked on Final Fantasy 1, 2 and 3, Ishii and Tanaka were well versed in the franchise. They understood that at its core, each game was always built around a group of strangers coming together to form a party. The narrative was then crafted around this framework and so were gameplay mechanics which had to accommodate for 3 to 4 players working together as a unit. Together, they decided that Final Fantasy 11 should be built around this same framework. But one challenge that needed to be overcome was scale. They could have hundreds, if not thousands of protagonists, each attempting to progress with the game at their own pace, but it was important for Ishii that they would all need to work together to achieve their goals. So they decided to make playing solo a recipe for disaster, just as it would be within any other Final Fantasy game. With this concept in mind, Ishii started to develop mechanics that would force collaboration and build camaraderie, and they all revolved around parties, which could consist of up to six people. As they had both worked together on Final Fantasy III, Tanaka and Ishii felt a job system would support this initiative, as it would give each player a clear role and responsibility within a party setup. To help introduce this concept, only six jobs would be offered to players at the start of the game. Warrior, Monk, Thief, Black Mage, White Mage, and Red Mage and these were chosen as they had pretty clear strengths and weaknesses based on their weapons, attributes and abilities. Out of this group, warriors were the natural tank, while monks, black mages and thieves were the natural damage dealers. Thieves, due to their high evasion, were also good at seeking enemies for the party to fight, while white mages would be there to make sure that everyone kept healthy. Red mages then fulfilled the jack of all trades role, able to deal damage or heal depending on the situation, while also taking up a support role at higher levels. Five additional jobs were also made available once a character reached level 30 and the associated quest was completed. These were Paladin, Dark Knight, Ranger, Bard and Beastmaster. These advanced jobs changed the dynamic of the game as Paladins were more suitable to tanking than Warriors due to their ability to control enmity. Dark Knights and Rangers were also more niche damage dealers and Bards excelled in the support role. Beastmasters were also offered as an alternative for those who preferred to play in somewhat isolation. It was also decided that a support job system should be implemented. This would be similar to what was seen within Final Fantasy Tactics, but would feature some notable differences. The equipable support job would only ever be half the level of the main job, but the player would receive every benefit from the job up to that level, including stats and abilities. This would give a black mage, for example, the ability to cast white magic, and also paladins access to abilities such as provoke if the player had warrior as their support job. It was a comprehensive system, but the developers realized that just giving people the tools wasn't enough if they weren't motivated to use them in the right way. 
So they decided to encourage the formation of parties by making the game's various story missions too difficult to complete alone after a certain point. They also designed the game such that leveling up beyond level 10 would be very tedious if not tackled as a group. But Ishii wanted to do more than just rely on difficulty to force people to cooperate with each other, and so he developed specific mechanics that would create more genuine experiences based around the highs and lows of, well, life. Perhaps the most controversial mechanic in this regard was experience penalties. These would be incurred should a character fall in combat and would see them lose a certain percentage of their experience points. In a worst case scenario, characters could even level down, taking away access to certain equipment and abilities that they could have used moments earlier. It was designed to be brutal. Ishii wanted failure to weigh heavy on people, and he believed that if everyone was aware of how harsh the penalties were for failure, players would gain empathy for each other and would in turn fight harder to defend their allies against such anguish in the hope that the gesture would be reciprocated. He also wanted there to be a real risk around death so that it would add to the drama. Players would have to think twice about taking on tough challenges as they could lose experience if they failed, but it also meant that the victories would become much sweeter. It created a balance between risk and reward, and that's where the magic of the game would come to the fore as the developers believed it would lead to grand gestures such as players sacrificing themselves for the greater good. To further build upon this notion of teamwork, Ishii also created specific gameplay mechanics such as skill chains, which allowed party members to deliver massive amounts of damage if members were able to coordinate with each other. Should two complementary weapon skills be used in quick succession, this would lead to one of the various skill chains being executed, and depending on the quality of the skill chain, a magic burst could then be performed by casting the correct elemental spell that was associated with the skill chain. For everything to work, the party had to be in sync. Guesswork and experience would only go so far as there were so many possible combinations and you only had 10 seconds to react. Ishii knew that these mechanics would be fundamental to Final Fantasy XI's success, but he also realised that withholding information was crucial to the game's long-term appeal. As players became more experienced with the game, Ishii knew that they would gain a deeper understanding of how things worked and he felt controlling this was important. It's why there are very few tutorials included and quests were made to be ambiguous. It was all part of the experience as they wanted players to learn through osmosis. It would force them to communicate and research if they wanted to improve. Plenty of systems were also developed to help players feel connected to the world. These included item synthesis and the auction house, which would be prominent parts of sustaining the game's economy. Ishii noted that he'd been told other games hadn't handled these particular aspects very well, so he wanted to create a system that was ingrained with the very fabric of the game itself. He believed the economy would help to give players a sense of purpose outside of their general play, as they would be able to contribute to something much larger. It saw Ishii work with Ewao and various other members of the team to understand the environment, what materials could be acquired from where and this would then help to drive the economy through drop rates and other acquisitions. Conquest was also designed with this objective in mind, as it would see individual players contribute to their faction's score. If everyone was able to collectively outperform rival factions, then they would receive rewards and this fulfilled each objective. It connected people, it controlled the flow of the game, and it also encouraged people to work together. These values also extended to how the game was developed. Ishii and Tanaka knew that to succeed, they would need to leverage talent from all over Square, but they adopted an approach not often employed on prior games, which would see collaboration encouraged within the more creative fields. They hoped it would help to make the final product more diverse, allowing it to cater to a wider set of tastes, especially as players would be able to make decisions about what their character would look like and from which nation they would hail. Ryosuke Aiba was selected as the game's art director and in the spirit of teamwork and collaboration, multiple designers worked on the same tasks. Perhaps the best example came with character designs. Tetsuya Nomura was responsible for creating concepts for only two of the races, the Hume and the Alvan. Nobuyoshi Mahara then created concepts for the Mithra and Galka, and Tamai Kasanugi designed the Taro Taro. Each was also given a secondary responsibility, with Nomura working on story-based NPCs, Mahara working on character and costume designs, and Kisanuki working on non-story-based NPCs. 
A similar approach was then adopted to the game's musical score, and this saw responsibilities divided between three composers. Naoshi Mizuta and Kumi Tanioka shared compositional duties for each major region, with Mizuta composing the bulk of the music for Sandoria and Windurst, while Tanioka covered Bastok. They also split character creation music down the middle, with Mizuta composing male themes and Tanioka composing female themes. Nobura Uematsu was then responsible for composing major themes, such as the game's orchestral introduction, Ron 4, which was used in a lot of promotional work, the prelude, and the airship theme. Uematsu also supported Sakaguchi's vision, as he chose to have the opening theme feature lyrics sung in Esperanto, also known as the international language. When all of these elements, philosophies and principles were combined, it helped to create an experience that could only be described as unique. Final Fantasy XI was unlike any MMORPG that had ever been created before. They had taken elements from existing MMOs and built what they believed was the essence of Final Fantasy on top, but not everything ended up going according to plan. Final Fantasy XI did launch on the 16th of May 2002 in Japan on the PlayStation 2, but the PC version didn't arrive until 6 months later. When it did, Final Fantasy XI became the first massively multiplayer online game in general to allow players on different platforms to play on the same server. Launching Final Fantasy XI at the same time in Japan and North America also turned out to be unfeasible, and this ended up working against the vision. When North Americans did get to play the game over a year later, many Japanese players were well versed with the game's mechanics, and were segregated due to the disparity in their levels of progression. To dilute this impact, Square chose to create more servers, but it still caused a lot of frustration. In spite of these setbacks, Final Fantasy XI ended up becoming a huge success story from both a critical and commercial perspective. Reviewers across the globe commended Final Fantasy XI for its unique, innovative mechanics, and at the time of its release, it was placed as the 35th best game of all time by Famitsu, ahead of Final Fantasy VI. In the West, GameSpot and IGN also both scored it well, with GameSpot noting that the tone of Final Fantasy XI was more uplifting than games of a similar standing. However, they did offer words of warning, as they felt traditional Final Fantasy fans may be put off by how jarringly different it was from anything else in the franchise. By December of 2012, just after the game had been launched on both platforms in Japan, it was just shy of having 200,000 subscribers, and it had already recouped the $16 million it had cost to develop the game and support it since launch. By the end of its staggered launch in North America, this number had more than doubled to 500,000 subscribers, something that saw Final Fantasy XI surpass EverQuest Online, the game that had served as such heavy inspiration for the team in those early days. It was still way short of Lineage and its sequel, but it established Final Fantasy XI as one of THE MMORPGs of its time, and even all time. Each expansion served to maintain its performance, as did a launch on the Xbox 360 and the accommodation of new languages. When subscriber numbers did eventually start to fall some 7 years after its initial launch, Final Fantasy XI had become a full-on representation of Sakaguchi's initial vision, by 2012, it had been declared as the most profitable game in the history of the franchise. The various expansions also helped to further the game's original principles, as each director that followed Ishii attempted to stay true to the original vision. Chains of Promathia, for example, introduced Promivian, which forced players to undertake difficult challenges under a strict level cap, while Treasures of Artugan introduced Besieged, which ended up being a partial realisation of a concept they couldn't implement within the base game. This would see players actively contributing to the world of Vanadiel in large groups. Some of the more extreme design choices, such as losing experience upon death, ended up being relaxed, and the requirement to form parties to progress through the game's story also ended up being softened. These decisions helped to keep existing players happy, while removing some of the barriers for new players that just didn't need to be there anymore and it's allowed Final Fantasy XI to keep a relatively stable player base even now, some 17 years after its original release. There's no new story content coming anymore, and the PlayStation 2 and Xbox 360 versions have been shut down, but that doesn't seem to matter, 
as depending on your source, there are approximately 50 to 90,000 people still subscribed. And that makes Final Fantasy XI one of the longest running MMOs still exclusively using a subscription based model, which is pretty impressive. Such was the success of Final Fantasy XI in its early days that Square Enix decided to give the all clear for Hiromichi Tanaka to work on a new MMO. This game started off being known as Rapture, but it would be announced in 2009 as Final Fantasy XIV some four years after development started. When it then released a year later, it was met with a rather frosty reception. But that's a story for another time. Now whether or not you've played Final Fantasy XI, I really hope this video served to show how meticulously they approached the task of making an MMO, despite not even knowing what it was when they started. And I'd like to thank JJ Zhang for suggesting we make a video talking about how Final Fantasy XI pushed the MMORPG genre forward. As a side note, we've had numerous comments about whether or not I have played Final Fantasy XI. And the answer is yes, I have. I played Final Fantasy XI for almost two years from September 2004 through to the summer of 2006. I played on Ragnarok. I had a level 75 Black Mage Tarot Tarot and I managed to complete the base story as well as the Rise of Zillard story, but I capped out on the airship fight on Chains of Promathia. During this time, I was a proud member of the British Geezer's Link Shell, so a shout out if any of you are watching. One of my earliest memories was actually meeting a guy called Jar, who became my first friend on the server. We met at the Valcom Dunes at level 10, and he was rocking an awesome warrior white mage combo, before quickly learning that that wasn't as good as he thought it was in his head. Either way, now that you've heard a very TLDR version of my experience from Final Fantasy XI, be sure to let us know in the comments what you thought of the video, and if you enjoyed it, please do hit that like button, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell so you get notified immediately when we publish new content. Alright guys, this is Daryl signing out. As always, I'd like to extend a huge thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, and of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.